It's a great pleasure of, of mine to be able to welcome our distinguished guests, our CGIR partners, members, um, and Center and Challenge Program directors, and staff, all of the friends of the CGIAR, to the 23rd Sir John Crawford Memorial Lecture. I have the great pleasure to introduce this year's Crawford Lecturer, Professor William Calvin. A theoretical neurobiologist, Professor Calvin is an affiliate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's the author of numerous books about brains and evolution. Speaking from this background, I believe that Professor Calvin will give us a fresh, fresh perspective on tonight on many of the items that we have been discussing this week, but help us think beyond the typical point of, of view. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Professor Calvin to the podium to deliver his lecture entitled, The Great Use It or Lose It Intelligence Test. Professor Calvin. Thank you. Uh, I thank the organizers for being so kind as to invite me. And I'm particularly honored, of course, to be able to speak in this magnificent hall for those of you who have not had a chance to survey all the paintings, I recommend you do so. The, <clears throat> that's Mount Rainier in Seattle. Uh, just to show you one of the endangered volcanoes, we can see four or five of them from a good hilltop in Seattle. Uh, later this century, the prediction is they will have lost all their ice. That will be a more serious problem in South America where that ice goes to uh, to provide the water supply for large cities in the Andes. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to spend a bit of time, first of all, introducing uh, <clears throat> I'm going to spend a little bit of time introducing human evolution to you. Uh, the evolution of intelligence is surprisingly more recent than we had thought. And then I'm going to take upon myself the topic of trying to explain to you what's happening with climate these days. Uh, we started out on the path up from the apes about seven million years ago uh, when our ancestors became upright, uh, but their brain size really didn't change for about four uh, five million years. We became essentially bipedal, uh, <clears throat> upright apes uh, living in woodlands. Uh, about 2,500 years ago is when the ice ages began. It's also when our brains began to get a bit bigger and uh, a lot of stone tool making appears. But it's uh, quite a lot longer before we get to Homo sapiens, our species. People that looked like us, had big brains like us, been around for about 200,000 years, but they didn't act like us. It, in the archeological record, you don't see things that really look like uh, they thought like us until about 50,000 years ago. So things like the cave art, here's perspective even uh, at 35,000 years ago. And there's no doubt we're dealing with a <clears throat> creative intelligence at this point. Uh, this happened in the middle of the last ice age. This is temperature that's being graphed for you here. And uh, the previous warm period, about 125,000 years ago, is over there on the left. And our warm period is over on the right. And you can see that our warm period since agriculture began has been remarkably stable compared to what preceded it. Uh, those rapid flips uh, take about five or 10 years to make the transition. Remarkably fast. Uh, so we became behaviorally modern. This creative explosion occurred in the midst of real chaos in terms of uh, whatever climate you were born into was likely to change in your, your or your grandchildren's lifetime into another state. We flipped from a warm and wet climate down into a cool, dry, windy, dusty climate, and after a few centuries, right back up again. <clears throat> 
Uh, once things settled down a little bit into warm and wet, it took about 2,000 years before agriculture really got going. And what makes it possible to settle down rather than keep roaming around is having domesticated enough species to make uh, a basic diet. Uh, that happened in China with rice, millet, pigs, silkworms by about 9,500 years ago. And in the Levant, it was an entirely different uh, set of domesticated species about the same time. Um, <clears throat> at that time, the Sahara was in the so-called pluvial stage. Sahara had grass all over it. It had <clears throat> Uh, grazing animals, there were elephants, uh, there were lots of lions, and there were lots of humans hunting. Uh, it's in this period that we see agriculture also developing, uh, typically uh, in the better places. And by about f f six to 5,000 years ago, the Sahara was changing to the desert that we now know. And it, it, there was a particularly big step around 5,200 years ago. Now that may be familiar to you as 3,200 BCE, and that's basically the uh, ancient kingdoms of Egypt. It's about the same time the Tigris Euphrates. Uh, the river civilizations that had to do a lot of irrigation, they needed a lot of organization to do the irrigation along the river. This meant a lot of taxes, tax accountants, and that's basically where writing was invented. All right. It took, what we got with that, besides taxes and writing, is we got cities, specialized occupations. Uh, we got armies uh, at this point. Uh, science as an organized endeavor has only been around for about the last 500 years. So the last one percent of the last one percent of the up from the apes time, and climate science has been around for only about fifty years, really, and it's basically ever since the oceanographers figured out that the oceans weren't going to take up all the CO2 that we were putting in the atmosphere, uh, and that we were indeed going to be in trouble. So, I'm a medical school professor, and we sort of look at the, the tension between uncertainty and risk somewhat differently. Um, we try to train physicians to always remember that there's a clock running, uh, the patient may deteriorate rapidly, uh, you can't spend too much time trying to make sure you're right of the diagnosis before you begin the act. We have an aphorism that says the doc who waits till dead certain of diagnosis before beginning treatment is likely to wind up with a dead patient. And it's that perspective of risk and doing things to avoid risk that I'd like to concentrate on tonight. I'm gonna to do it by telling you in the first half uh, some of the uh, history of the subject and particularly we've already had 50 years of climate change. Uh, <clears throat> then I, that will lead me into some more familiar terrain about the uh, way we produce our uh, extra CO2 and what could be done quite differently. And I'm going to concentrate at the end upon the, what I'm calling the tortoise and the hare analogy. Uh, the IPCC reports that are talk about having to gradually reduce our emissions and things of that sort in order to hold it down to a two or three degree uh, temperature rise that those things can be preempted by sudden things that may happen in the meantime. I'm gonna show you some sudden things that have already happened that we've just recognized. The first thing uh, I'm gonna tell you about is how much light gets reflected back out in space before it can heat things up. That is to say bright surfaces like clouds or ice or snow, deserts, reflect back uh, 50 to 90% sometimes of the incoming light uh, and bounce it right back out. Uh, <clears throat> this is what agriculture sometimes changes. This is Tigris Euphrates Valley. It shows how bright things are. And that smudge in the middle 
are green leaves. This is mostly from irrigation, uh, but that changes the amount of heat absorbed by the earth. Uh, in other words, when you change a bright desert into a, a, <clears throat> a green area, you're also warming the earth by doing it. Uh, <clears throat> agricultural herding practices make a difference too. This is the border between Egypt and Israel in the Sinai Desert. The very first pictures back from space, from satellites, remarked upon this feature because no other national boundaries are usually visible from outer space, but this one is. It's a difference between whether there are goats around or not. On the Israeli side, they uh, prohibit grazing in, in a nature preserve. And as you see in the upper right corner, there's uh, uh, patches of vegetation that get going in mounds. And their root system sort of stabilizes the soil there. And that's what the goat's hooves tend to, uh, to break apart. So that when winds come along and uh, pick up the sands, you get a lot of burial of things. The active dune systems pictured on the left. Now here's a, a, a lesson basically about how much light gets reflected back and how quickly, basically overnight, it can change. Uh, fresh snow, the sort of powder snow that skiers love, reflects about 90% of light back in space. 10% goes in to heat things. After the surface is melted, just for one afternoon, the next day it's going to reflect back only 70%. Now that represents a tripling of, of the amount of heat absorbed by the Earth. And the same thing happens uh, when you darken the surface with dust blowing in or soot. Uh, the picture here is a maple leaf laying on the top of the snow that has dug itself in quite a ways because it absorbs the heat very nicely and melts the snow underneath. <clears throat> This is a picture of the top of the world looking down on the North Pole. And you can see the US and Canada over on the left. Uh, you can see the expanse of Siberia. And you can see Europe very well. The ice in the middle is floating ice. And the North Pole is right under that E in winter. Uh, <clears throat> the ice in Greenland right below it is about three kilometers thick. Floating ice is about three meters thick. Now basically, if you add more snow on top of it, you just melt some off the bottom, uh, and it never gets much thicker than... If you dug, dug a basement up there for a house, you'd wind up with a swimming pool. Now, <clears throat> ocean waters uh, absorb most of the sunlight that hits them. So when ice melts back, there's about a nine-fold increase in the heat being absorbed. And that's one of the reasons that ice can melt back very quickly. Uh, this is another source of atmospheric heating. This is a fascinating uh, little movie that I made up of the uh, NASA's Terra satellite. It has an a, um, <clears throat> instrument on it that can pick up uh, such things as fires and chlorophyll. And this just shows you the annual round of agricultural fires. It really shows you where um, agriculture is, at least the kind that, that makes use of this planting time. Uh, <clears throat> the problem with this is that it's much more soot in the atmosphere around the year than ever existed back in the days of mere forest fires. Uh, there's just nothing like this that happened you know, before agriculture. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been happening in the last 50 years. We've been seeing more extreme weather. This picture shows you three typhoons at once in the waters south of Japan. This happened last year. It's not a composite picture. All three of those were there on the same day. And <clears throat> we're also seeing such things as heat waves, 35,000 excess deaths in Europe during a few week period in 2003. One of the reasons you get higher winds with global warming is that the land warms up more than the oceans do. The oceans don't run out of water for evaporative cooling and the land surface does. Uh, and so the greater temperature contrast means much higher winds uh, connecting the two. 
As wind speed goes up, so do damages. You might think that if the wind speed were to go up 20% from, say, 50 miles an hour to 60, that the damage that the insurance company has to pay would go up 20%. But no, it goes up 500%. That is what we call a nonlinear uh, response. And uh, the world is full of them. Uh, we've seen some fairly spectacular things with high winds in the United States. This is about 20 highway trucks like this were blown over one night on a major interstate highway. And I, I, I use it here to emphasize that it's the widening of the extremes more than the changes in the average that tend to do the damage. Uh, <clears throat> wider extremes get us closer to thresholds where things flip and trucks flipping over is a good example. This happened in a Seattle suburb where Bill Gates lives, a few blocks down the street from this. And it's a, a large garbage truck that blew over on a nice red Mercedes convertible. And you're familiar in agriculture with a, a flip threshold that has to do with losing a second crop if the rains are delayed sufficiently in the springtime. Those are the kinds of examples that cause uh, a lot of human problems. Now, one of the earliest things that the models did was to, could you still hear me? You still hear me now? Uh, one of the earliest things the models did was to predict that we were going to get less rain at, say, Mediterranean latitudes, that we were going to get more rain up at the higher latitudes, say, in Northern Europe. Uh, and that certainly proved to be the case. But <clears throat> somewhere in between, you would think there's a spot where uh, there's, the rain doesn't change. And that may be true that the average rain doesn't change. But the predictions of the climate models are that you'll have more extreme weather to create that same unchanged average. I say there will be more floods and more droughts mixed in to that uh, averaging. Now, <clears throat> we call this more extreme weather, and it applies in many places. It certainly makes obsolete such notions as the 100-year floods insurance companies like to rely upon for setting their premiums. There have been more major floods every decade since 1950. This is from the IPCC report, and what it shows you in the Americas is the 1950s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, uh, with the number of major floods climbing every decade. This is not peculiar to the Americas. It's true elsewhere. You can see Asia has gone up spectacularly in terms of major floods. So is Africa, so is Europe. So this is not just trouble that is moving around. Moving in lockstep like this is evidence of real climate change. Sometimes the climate change also takes a jump. And you see that particularly for drought. If you are plotting here uh, the drought as a how much of the land surface is in drought at any one time. Back in the 1970s, it used to be 15%. Then in the mid-1980s, it took a jump. It went up to 25% and stayed there. It's something you only recognize in retrospect when you realize the variations are occurring around a new baseline now. There have even been jumps up to 35%. So this is the kind of thing that the models are saying will happen, but as we look back at the record, we've seen that they've already been happening. So the models have been very good, but by and large, they have understated the problems. Uh, most of the climate models we have made uh, were quantitatively uh, pretty good, qualitatively pretty good, but uh, things were worse than uh, they predicted. So climate does jump from one state to another, judging from drought. Uh, you can also see it in most of the areas around the world that have a Mediterranean climate. 
Now, let me tell you what a Mediterranean climate is, in case you don't know, and I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, <clears throat> with it hotter around the equator, there's a lot of hot, moist air that rises. Uh, mostly it falls back into the ocean's rain. But the air that goes up has to come back down someplace, and it tends to come down in a band at a bit higher latitudes uh, that surround it. This whole area collectively is known as the tropics, but it's obviously that it's dry uh, up further from the equator, about 20 to 30, sometimes 35 degrees. Uh, <clears throat> the Mediterranean zones of the world are where you, you basically don't have rainfall in the summertime, but you do have rainfall during the winter time. And basically, what happens is that during the winter time, uh, this is where the westerly winds begin, and low pressure systems manage to sneak in uh, and deliver uh, moisture during the winter. What seems to be happening now is the tropics are widening. Uh, it's a few hundred kilometers already by now. And what this does is expands uh, the whole picture. And now the dry zones, where there's not much winter rain that manages to get in, is beginning to cover North Africa. It's certainly covering Southern Australia, as you see. Uh, it's causing problems up in California. Uh, it's also causing problems down in Chile. These are about train climbings are on the west side of continents because the westerly winds are, are bringing in the moisture. Here's Western Australia from a satellite view of false color. Uh, all the brown stuff is parched as vegetation during the dry season. Uh, Perth water reservoirs uh, <clears throat> have been having a great deal of trouble. In 1975, their average uh, intake each year from the streams from the runoff of the area, uh, fell by half, and it stayed there. In 1997, it dropped down to one-third. So that goes along with what I was showing you, at least in the mid-'80s, you could see it in the worldwide totals. Uh, major things have been happening already. So again, we're talking here about climate can jump from one state to another. There are some things like those gradually increasing floods through five decades that look gradual, but there's other parts that tell you things are happening in jumps. Here's Southern California's Mediterranean climate, and these are the fires that occurred a month ago. The red dots are uh, fires, and this picture shows you the aftermath. Uh, it's false color. The reds are recently burned areas. So there's very substantial areas from summer fires up here and all along through here shows you the enormous amount of, of uh, land which was burned in these fires. Again, this is not the one I showed you before, which was floods. This is major wildfires since 1950. And again, decade by decade, in the Americas it has soared, in Europe it's gone way up, in Asia it's way up, in Australia and East it's gone way up, and in Africa it's gone way up. Uh, some of this, of course, is nicely correlated with temperature. This is just the western U.S. record for spring and summer temperatures. Uh, the black line is the temperature, and the red bars are the number of major forest fires that year. Uh, and you see there's a very nice correlation. If you're having a particularly hot year, uh, the fires are way up because the land uh, becomes parched much more readily. Now, we, we tend to assume in our reasoning about uh, carbon inputs to the atmosphere that in agriculture, uh, what is cut down and you know, lost as CO2 to the atmosphere through uh, fire or decomposition will be replaced later in the year by new growth that will take out an equivalent amount of carbon from the air. It's not really equivalent because there's a lot of loss from muddy waters from irrigation and the like that aren't included in that. But if a forest burns or dead wood decomposes, <coughs> it may take a century to recapture that 
carbon from the air. So it's not like agriculture at all. And if we're having to live on the time scale of the century, any major forest fire like this is sheer loss to us in the sense of coping with our carbon problem. There's an additional peculiarity, and that is if the Amazon burns, it will not grow back at all. There's a peculiarity in the hydrological cycle for the Amazon that says it will revert to savanna. So let's talk now about getting into hot water, by which I mean oceans initially. This shows the oceans around the world are warming. The six lines are from the six major ocean basins of the world, all sort of normalized to a common level. Uh, and it shows you that there's, since 1975, for 30 years, there's been a nice upwards trend uh, with a gap in the middle here of a few years. And that's the Mount Pinatubo eruption, you know, this thing. Injected sulfates well up into the stratosphere. Uh, and they uh, attract enough moisture to them that they become very shiny. This produces a haze. And that reflects sunlight back in the space. So it, it, this is a way of cooling the Earth. And there's a lot of discussions going on about geoengineering of whether we could help survive heat waves, for example, by some uh, man-made injections of sulfate into the stratosphere. Uh, <clears throat> but that sort of approach to our heating problem will not solve the other CO2 problem. And it's beginning to get serious. Uh, the other thing that CO2 does, because about half of it so far of the excess has been taken up by the oceans, that causes them to become more acidic, which in turn becomes more corrosive to the shells of the zooplankton and the coral. Uh, the projection is that, I, first of all, it's already fallen over the last century, about one-tenth of the pH unit, or rhythmic scale. And the models suggest two to three tenths more per century. That's well into the range where um, if the coral reef isn't dead already, it will be dead and reabsorbed into the ocean. So they will be sort of crumbling like uh, sugar, sugar cubes in the iced tea uh, and going into solution. Uh, here's a reminder that uh, hurricanes, typhoons, Tropical cyclones is the scientific name, uh, <clears throat> thrive on hotter surfaces. But the hot water by itself causes a great deal of damage to the coral reefs. And from the 2005 hurricane season in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, there's a real disaster with the coral. Uh, the whole path coming in to the Gulf of Mexico got sufficiently hot for enough days during this to kill off a great deal of the coral in these regions that are colored uh, red-orange. Uh, it's been verified, for example, by the divers in the Virgin Islands National Park. And they reported that even down to a 70-meter depth, there were now dead coral reefs. The other thing, of course, that heats up is the air, and particularly at the high latitudes. This, the reddish colors in this represent several degrees Celsius of warming, about three degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and each point is evaluated against its temperature from about 40 years ago. And so these are all regions that just in 2001 to 2006 have been warming up. Uh, <clears throat> you've, I think, heard what will happen to the polar bears in this circumstance. It will be a great population crash. Uh, but this is what's been happening to the pack ice that they thrive on. This, again, is looking down the top of the world. The black dot is the North Pole. And this is floating ice, several meters or more thick. And this shows you the amount that's left in September at the end of the season where it shrinks. So this is the minimum uh, averaged over about 30 years. This is what happened this year. If any of you can see the little green line going up there, 
that's two years ago. So I'd point out here there's no sea level rise from this because it's floating already and just like ice cubes and glass, it's not going to change the level. Um, however, much of the ice that we have to worry about is perched on top of land where it can be, in the case of Greenland, about three kilometers thick as opposed to the three meters, perhaps, for sea ice. And it's the question of that Greenland ice or West Antarctic ice melting that are the big concerns. Because they have two ways of raising sea level. One is dripping water in, and the other is just sliding off of the land into the ocean. And these are the areas around the edges of Greenland that have been warming up particularly uh, in the summer of 05 compared to previous years. And this is the biggest of the outlet glaciers uh, from Greenland. This is at Jakobshaven at about 69 degrees north on the west side. That ice stream is eight kilometers wide and it advances at about 30 to 40 meters each day, which is twice as fast as a decade ago. So let's talk about sea level rise now. We have records that show what happened the last time about half of Greenland melted. This happened 125,000 years ago in the last warm period in the Ice Age. And sea level then rose at least six meters more than our present level uh, because Greenland and the other high northern latitudes were particularly hot in the summertime at that uh, point. And the sea level rise is, is not only from, from the Greenland uh, itself, but as the sea level rose down in Antarctica, it probably let loose some of its ice. Uh, <clears throat> the important thing to remember here is that this melting uh, is, it takes about three degrees in Greenland to do this. But you get three degrees in Greenland from a 1.6 degree global warming. Okay, the northern latitudes, like the middle of continents, you have to multiply by about two to find out the local temperature compared to the global mean. Well, here's what happens with a six meter rise in sea level. Here is the Florida Peninsula sticking out into the Gulf of Mexico, and the red all around shows you the six foot a uh, six meter elevation line. Uh, the white dots that you see are people. It shows you the population density. You can see Orlando there in the middle, and it, even it has a uh, new waterfront in the suburbs. But most of the people live around the edge of Florida, and that's at least 15 million climate refugees. This shows you the part of the east coast of the U.S. Uh, down at the bottom, you'll notice there's a 150 kilometer incursion. Um, let's not do that yet. Back up. Uh, you'll notice the Chesapeake Bay doubles and triples in width. Uh, Boston up at the top uh, gets covered to the extent that MIT is underwater, but Harvard is higher up on the hill and Harvard will remain as a little peninsula sticking out to the new Boston Bay. That's the, how serious the problem is in protecting this. The shoreline of the Gulf and the East Coast of the United States are about 12,000 miles, say 19 kilometers. Uh, that's an awful lot of territory to build a seawall around. I don't think it will happen. And if it does, the cement required to do it will make global warming ever so much worse because making cement turns out to release an enormous amount of CO2. Well, here's the um, Washington, D.C. Nice aerial photograph from Google, of course. Um, <clears throat> and it shows you the, the White House up here, Pennsylvania Avenue, Capitol Hill down here, all your favorite art galleries and museums along the mall. And if they don't start paying attention, uh, this will remind them. 
That's what a six meter sea level rise will back up the Potomac River enough to do. Now, I would say never fear here. The World Bank will be above it all. <laughs> Unfortunately, the World Bank will have a task like nothing else. This is what a six meter sea level rise in red does to the river deltas of Asia. Bangladesh alone, about half of the, surf, half of the land will be inundated. Uh, half of their population is about 70 million people. They're climate refugees, and the question is, where are they going to move to? The same problem occurs all the way around each major river delta, uh, all the lowland areas. Um, the last estimate I saw for the Yangtze was about 93 million people displaced. Uh, these are going to be major problems, and that kind of movement of people, particularly if one's across national bar borders, is not usually greeted in a very friendly fashion. I think that climate refugees on this scale will cause probably a lot of genocides. It's certainly been the history of, of humans. And I think that we have to remember that that's one of the, where this isn't going to be a gradual controlled descent, that we are likely to have very substantial chaos in the world. And the kind of chaos that will keep people from investing money at any interest rate. Um, and national governments that really don't have the resources to cope with solving the climate problem anymore. This shows you the Maldives. Uh, one of the countries that will disappear long before six meters. The average uh, elevation in the Maldives is 1.5. That's their capital city, Mali. A uh, number of uh, island nations that are in this position. Now I come to the more traditional part where I'm going to talk about CO2, where it comes from, the methane rise, and the whole notion of CO2 equivalents that will allow us to look at the big picture a bit better. This is the Keeling Curve, named after Charles David Keeling, who died recently at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. And this shows you how the CO2 has been arriving since measurements started in 1958. Measurements are made atop uh, <clears throat> Mauna Loa in Hawaii to be away from industrial sources. Uh, so this is measuring the trade winds coming along at the top of the, the peak in order to sample the CO2. And you can see that the, the slope of the, of the rise down here at the bottom uh, is about one third what it is currently. So we've been putting out more and more Basically, since 1990 to 2005, uh, the amount of uh, emissions have gone up 35%. It's even worse than the so-called business as usual scenarios that we use in climate models. That's how fast we've been perturbing the situation. We have an additional source of CO2 measurement, and that is we can measure CO2 from far into the past because they're preserved in ice bubbles in Antarctica. You drill a big core down and you get it up, you can slice it up, and you can put a slice which has numerous air bubbles in it in a chamber, pump out the air, and then melt the ice and sample the atmospheric composition from a half million years ago, which is what's shown here. In a lovely exhibit at, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at CSD. Uh, what it shows you are the ice age variations in CO2. Uh, you get up to where that dotted line is uh, at the beginning of a warm period in the Ice Age. Uh, but we've never gone above the, that peak at about 300 until now. We're now up to about 380. Uh, we've really doubled the, the range. I mean, we're, we're so far outside of the normal range uh, that anyone who goes around saying that what's happening is just you know, natural cycles in nature, and we can't interfere with that, uh, really needs to be reminded that there really is data on the subject. Uh, this is just a repeat on the top of what you just saw, 
uh, but you now see that the methane, which can be measured at the same time, has been going up and down. Methane is the second largest uh, greenhouse gas that we have to worry about. The bottom trace is the temperature in Antarctica. You can get all these out of an ice core. Uh, over on the right, I've just spread out the scale for the last 150 years. And you can see that the uh, temperature has been going up, but it hasn't gone up anything like the greenhouse gases have. There have been some things that have been preventing that, and part of that is um, all the um, muck in the atmosphere that reflects things back out in space. Basically, particularly in the 1950 to 1975 era, when it sort of looked like temperature wasn't rising, uh, the rise was being masked by uh, the exceptional smog that we had. I certainly remember uh, what that was like before the catalytic converter was invented. <clears throat> I'd point out that methane's half-life in the atmosphere um, is about six years. That is to say, if you go around to the natural gas pipelines and you tighten up on their leaks, which I hope they're doing, because they leak at about 1% to 4% of their total, um, <clears throat> if you fix that, you get a pretty fast fix within a decade or so, if you have that long to wait. Uh, carbon in the atmosphere doesn't come down for centuries. As I say, the half time is more like 200 years, and at least a fourth of it is left in a thousand years from now. And <clears throat> so we now, however, because we can treat methane, it's 23 times more potent than, um, than CO2 as a heat trapper. But we can take its concentration, multiply it by 23, add it to CO2, and get the CO2 equivalent as if the whole warming was done by CO2 instead. But we can do the same thing for the nitrous oxide from fertilizers. We can do it with some of the albedo uh, changes and other things like uh, cutting down trees. Uh, we, can, we can sort of equate them all to one another in this CO2 equivalent fashion. And that's where this pie chart comes from. Uh, what this shows you is that agricultural kinds of things are this one third on the right. Uh, lumping in land use changes because most of them, in fact, are clearing land for agriculture. That's basically about one third of the problem. Uh, the rest of it uh, comes from uh, heating and lighting buildings, the transport sectors, only 14%, as it turns out. Uh, electricity for all sorts of purposes is 24%, industrial uses of fossil fuels, uh, 14 and so on. So I'm going to take here some examples of how to change that, that we already know about, where we don't have to engage in much hand-waving. And I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of reforming at least the passenger car aspect. Now, when I, w I remember very well when I was in Hungary uh, before the Berlin Wall fell, and it was an amazing collection of cars I had never seen before. And I remember going back about 1996, and not a single one of those cars was left on the road. Okay, that's how fast, you know, the whole transportation um, can turn over. And that's about what we ought to see if we take seriously getting off of petroleum for doing our commuting. Uh, this is a hydrogen fuel cell car that Honda is making in production quantities this next year. Uh, if you have a hydrogen filling station around, you might be able to get one. Uh, they're mostly going to be sold to fleets uh, that do have one. Uh, <clears throat> there's another way, basically you're using electricity to produce the hydrogen. And if the electricity is clean, uh, so is the commuting. Uh, you can do the same thing actually uh, using compressed air. You can use electricity to compress air and you can run it through an engine whose pistons are driven by the uh, compressed air being released. And India will be producing about 6,000 of these next year uh, to use as taxi cabs. Uh, I should point out that there is a, um, a particularly nice benefit from these. 
you think of engines as running hot. This is an engine that will run cold from that expanding compressed air. And that means the passengers will get free air conditioning. I can imagine this becoming very popular and it doesn't require the kinds of high-tech fuel cells uh, and batteries that many countries might not be able to import uh, readily. And of course, there's the issue of using batteries on board cars, either as plug-in hybrids uh, or as all electric vehicles, and basically recharge them overnight. Now, if we start running short of electricity to use to do this, I have some candidates for where I might get it from. Uh, this happens to be uh, the Americas to show you what the street lights are at night seen from outer space. Incredible amount of electricity being wasted to do this, putting demand uh, motion detectors on those street lights would save quite a lot of electricity that could in turn be used for uh, these um, either electric or compressed air or hydrogen uh, alternatives. So there's a number of things that are in the works and there are major sources like this to tap in conservation. Now, let me talk about the power sector for a minute because alternative ways of generating electricity are of particular concern because so much of it is now done with coal, which is twice as bad a greenhouse gas uh, producer as an equivalent uh, kilowatt hour produced from natural gas with oil somewhere in between. So changing the mix of how we get our electricity is uh, a big topic of discussion. I just want to show you a little history. This shows you the years 1971 over on the left uh, and uh, mid uh, part of this decade over on the right. And that just shows you how things changed over the years. The US is producing 140% more electricity over a 32 year period at currently we're getting 68% of our electricity from fossil fuels, the gas, oil, and coal added together. Uh, here's a different way of doing it that France tried out. France uh, began building, getting most of its growth, which amounts to 260% over the period. Uh, they got primarily from nuclear. They are now in a situation, because they have 13% from hydro, that 91% of their electricity is clean and only 9% is dirty. Uh, looking around the world, you'll see various figures on this. Uh, even France's neighbors uh, provide an interesting 58% uh, fossil fuel in Germany, only 1% in Switzerland. Uh, in the UK, it's 75% fossil fuel, and in India and uh, uh, China are a bit above that. So you see an enormous variation around the world, and one of our uh, responses has to be to, to learn some lessons from those who uh, have done it particularly well in the past. Here's a, a particularly instructive example from the United States. Uh, this is the per capita use of electricity. Uh, each year. So the average person in the US was consuming about 4,000 kilowatt hours, and now it's up to about three times that. But California in the 70s held it flat, quite remarkably, through a whole series of things that they did. Uh, I'm not going to try to list them here, but I point out, as they do, that. It also saved the consumers about $1,000 per family annually. So there are good lessons that we can learn from areas in the world that have done it differently. But I'd like to point out to you the magnitude of the problem. We need several gigawatt. A gigawatt is 1,000 is megawatts, but it's the size of a nuclear plant. It's the size of a big coal plant. So a gigawatt is sort of my, sort of my standard unit. Um, uh, due to band alone in China has got them uh, constructing in terms of that magnitude each week. Uh, the United States plans uh, about that amount each month. Of course, we only have one-fourth number. 
suppose China does. And, but as we began to use electricity from automobiles, uh, we're going to need even more. And of course, we're going to need a lot more to replace the fossil fuels. We really have to think big about how we're going to tackle electricity production. And as fond as people are of solar and wind, I'd, I'd like to point out that uh, they don't scale up very well. Uh, they, first of all, no one's built a gigawatt you know, of them very, uh, maybe once, but certainly not very often, and certainly not on the scale of once a week. Uh, <clears throat> they don't scale up for the following reason. Uh, they fluctuate. The cloud comes along and the solar output drops down. Um, a wind surge comes along and spins the wind turbines faster and you can get a surge in the power lines. Uh, our electrical grids are unstable. That's why we have blackouts. And it's only the skill of the operators in predicting the load and tuning the generation uh, that actually keeps them from collapsing much more regularly. If you add a lot of stuff that naturally fluctuates, you're going to have a lot of blackouts unless you invent some new control system to control the electrical grids and basically rebuild them. Uh, I don't think we have time for that to happen. Uh, this shows you, for the U.S. as it happens, all uses of electricity, 86% fossil fuel. This is including transportation now. There's oil in this, 40% of which two-thirds is imported. Uh, coal, 23%, natural gas, 23%. Uh, the only clean ones are nuclear at 8%, and there's a 6% which comes from that bar on top, about 3% biomass burning, that's uh, corn stalks, uh, sawdust, and so forth. Uh, hydroelectric, about the same amount. Uh, geothermal uh, is only a third of a percent of our total, but there's a lot of room for expansion there. There's no room really for expansion in hydro in many places. Uh, but basically, to just get a nuclear sized slice, that little 8%, of which you need 10 of them to wipe out the fossil fuel use, uh, just to get one nuclear slice would take a 133 fold increase in solar, 66% increase in wind. I mean, these are really big. And it shows you the, the magnitude of the problem we face. Now, you can add nuclear. Uh, it's going to be possible in the US to put up a new plant within about three years construction time if you use a standard plan. And certainly, the experience of the rest of the world, which has been building nuclear, uh, ever, we haven't since 1978, but one's going to start in Texas next year. Uh, the other thing on the horizon that I'd like to mention, because almost no one's heard of it, uh, but it's starting up uh, next year. Uh, mostly you think of geothermal as being a hot springs area thing, and if you don't have a hot springs, why talk about it? Uh, but there's a new version coming out that's thanks to the oil companies' deep drilling techniques and their ways of stimulating oil fields to get further production. Basically, you drill down avoiding water, you drill down until you get into a hot rock that's about the temperature of an, a baking oven, about uh, uh, f several hundred you know, degrees or so. Um, and then you drill a second well down, and you pump water down one well, and steam flashes up the other well and runs an old-fashioned steam turbine on the surface. This little Steam turbine operation just sort of sets there. There's no trucks coming in and out. There's no pollution. It's a small footprint. Uh, it's a pretty nice way of generating electricity. And it's suitable for developing countries in the sense that uh, it just depends on how deep you have to drill and how many of them you have to drill in order to get uh, good, clean electricity. Now let's come back to agriculture. As I say, this is almost a third. The agriculture itself is 14%, and that's equal to the problem with transportation. In agriculture, it comes from actually tilling the soil, which, of course, speeds decomposition of the soil, which puts CO2 in the air, it includes the fertilizer uh, effects. Uh, 
and, ver and various others, uh, such as the muddy runoffs that in most river deltas go straight to CO2. But notice this 18% land use. Now, some of that ex cities expanding in the suburbs and so forth, but around the world, the great uh, impact is one of cutting down forests, such as slash and burn techniques and forestry, uh, and removing leaves would otherwise do photosynthesis and remove some CO2. So though that's the pie that we have to tackle, and there are obvious ways that we can tackle it. I just want to point out to this audience that uh, agriculture is going to have quite a role in this. There's a lot, I think, of low-hanging fruit in terms of plowing and irrigation uh, practices uh, that can be changed. Uh, but innovation in the agricultural area may uh, prove to be every bit as important as innovation in producing electric power in getting the situation better in hand. Uh, this leads me to the issue of actually taking CO2 out of circulation. All the discussion that you've heard of is changing only the amount put in every year. It's currently growing, that 35% I talked about. And the first goal is to keep it from growing every year, just add a constant amount each year. Some people have the nerve to call the stabilization, which it certainly isn't. Uh, <clears throat> so reducing emissions is not going to be enough. We're actually going to have to take out uh, some of the carbon that we've put into the air. There's some ways of doing that. Uh, here's a list. I'll just show you a couple. Um, <clears throat> You can plant more trees, and there are lots of good reasons for planting trees besides uh, serving to take carbon out of the air, but uh, they're not a very reliable way of keeping the carbon out of the air. If you have a climate forecast that says it's going to be hotter, drier, windier, there's going to be a lot more forest fire, and the, all your sequestered carbon will go back into circulation uh, in a few days. So it's not reliable. Here's the other major source besides green leaves, and that's microalgae in the surface layers of the ocean, uh, called phytoplankton. Uh, they already do about half of the world's photosynthesis, although most of it's for their own use, because they too have a metabolism that requires them to take in oxygen and put out CO2. Um, <clears throat> one of the side benefits of it is called the biological pump. As say, some of the zooplankton create uh, calcium carbonate shells, and that means when they die and the shell sinks down into the ocean depths, that's actually taking carbon that would otherwise interact with the atmosphere down into deep storage. Uh, there are micro snails, like this very pretty one, and they too have shells and that sink to the depths. Uh, there are vacuum cleaners of the ocean, like the salps, that go along filtering out plankton of all sorts, they produce fecal pellets that are dense enough to fall down to the depths before disintegrating. And of course, there's whale-sized devices that also exist for doing this, called whales. They filter plankton of all sorts. So taking atmospheric carbon out of circulation for at least hundreds of years uh, may become the name of the game uh, you can imagine uh, simply taking organic matter out of circulation before it decomposes uh, and seal it. There's a recent paper that shows that while most river deltas of the world, uh, the mud, the organic material goes out there and within a matter of years, it's all decomposed in CO2 in the atmosphere. But in the uh, monsoon runoff from the Himalaya, it comes down through India and Bangladesh, out into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, this turns out to be an exception. Uh, only about 30% of it actually winds up in the atmosphere. The rest gets sealed uh, uh, where the, inter the ocean can't interact with it. Basically because it comes out in these three big pulses every year with the monsoons, uh, a lot of it gets laid down and it doesn't decompose very fast which means the end of season runoff basically caps it. So only the top uh, four centimeters or so uh, is left to interact with the ocean. So this, these are ways of, of taking carbon out of circulation.
and I suspect uh, agriculture is going to have a considerable role in inventing new ways to do this. Uh, <clears throat> now let's talk about speed. Um, <clears throat> The IPCC reports, while they, they mention sudden things can happen, are mostly about producing detailed scenarios for how quickly, how slowly things can happen. That is to say, they talk about the slow study getting worse of things and what we have to do in the way of emissions to make them not go so fast. And they make you think in terms of this time scale of half a century or more uh, to the result and they keep you from thinking about the 10-year window that we have to cope with. Uh, the slow study scenarios that the IPCC produced do show you that there's a 10-year window for effective action, and it's the next 10 years. This is from Science Magazine just last week, and it just shows you a sketch of temperature uh, and the emission scenarios, but basically this Dot dashed line here is the pessimistic scenario, business as usual. Uh, the dotted line shows you a scenario that will get, so you stabilize by the end of uh, 2200 at about two and a half degrees above present. And all the numbers, all the uh, labels on the right show you what the other parts of the IPCC reports say uh, will be the effects. So again, I point out that these are for slow study changes. They assume nothing sudden happens that sets you back. You know, like droughts going for 15 to 25 percent, things that have already happened. For example, uh, well, let's show you some markers here. For We're already seven-tenths up into the game, and two and three degree warmings are what are most often talked about. Uh, <clears throat> And all of these results are for these no-jump scenarios. Now, <clears throat> they assume that at two and a half degrees that there'll be this major loss of Amazon rainforest. And I'm just about to show you what happened in 1999, or almost happened, at temperatures of today. Um, <clears throat> basically, two degrees causes the loss of all those mountain glaciers I can see from Seattle and all the ones that South Americans rely upon for water supply, and that's true many places in the world. Three degrees has such disruption of ecosystems and such a loss of things that we expect and such high losses from floods and windstorms and such uh, that it's a, it's a result of enormous numbers of climate refugees, uh, considerable genocides, considerable amount of warfare when one country decides to take over the resources of its neighbor, while of course pushing the people out into a third country, and so forth. That's the kind of future we've got to avoid, and we're not talking about avoiding it, only postponing it. Uh, for example, we reached two degrees in mid-century, under the pessimistic scenario. And under the optimistic scenario, we reach it about 12 years later in this particular sketch. Um, <clears throat> so clearly, we need to talk about scenarios that go beyond this. Uh, but let me show you where the 10 years comes from. This is a carbon emission, in other words, per year gigatons, we're at about eight gigatons a year now. And the top uh, black line there is the business as usual scenario. Uh, <clears throat> and it results in a warming of about six degrees by the end of the century, uh, which would be quite catastrophic. Uh, <clears throat> this shows you a scenario of bringing emissions down uh, after they have topped out at about uh, 1940. Um, that results by the end of the century in about a three degree warming. That's the one I said was definitely into big climate refugee territory. If we turn emissions around, that is to say, 
take the growth out of emissions, <laughs> you're still releasing a lot every year, uh, by about 2016 or 2020, uh, you hold it down to about two degrees under the slow study, no, nothing sudden uh, framework. So I, I propose that we really need to talk about some scenarios that, that cure the problem and not just prolong the agony. Uh, that is to say, we need something that will actually take the CO2 out of the air, I outlined you some ways of doing that, and haul the temperature back down to at least present levels, if not further. Uh, that will reverse a lot of the extreme weather. Uh, it will not entirely stop Greenland from melting. That will probably continue, though at a slower rate. Uh, it will not bring back the species that have gone extinct in the meantime. But it does have the prospect for returning us to some semblance of where we are now. The people who have been studying ancient climate changes, like the one I showed in the second slide, uh, have an aphorism. Uh, climate is like a drunk. Left alone, it sets, but force it to move, and it staggers. It lurches. And I think we saw some of that in the mid-80s with, with the drought. Uh, the tortoise and the hare, if you remember from the fable, has this race between the tortoise and the hare, but the um, hare gets so far out in front that it lays down, takes a nap, and the tortoise goes past it and wins the race. Now, unfortunately, winning the race in our analogy is sort of arriving at the drop-off for a fast descent into hell. This is, you've got to think, I mean, both the hare and the tortoise need to reverse gear <laughs> uh, when you get down to it. But the point is, is that the IPCC scenarios treat climate as if it moved like a tortoise. And they assume the hare will take a conveniently long nap. And I, I submit that's not a safe assumption, <laughs> that uh, there's plenty of evidence that we've just seen. Here's that global drought popping up. Uh, here's that change in the Perth uh, uh, runoff, uh, dropping down to a half and a third. And now I'm going to show you what's probably the worst case of all, and it represents something that almost happened in 1999. 97-98, as you remember, is the big El Nino. This shows the little red dots are the familiar fires that are spotted by satellite. And these are mostly agricultural fires, and some of them are slash and burn fires. The colors represent the state of the forest at the end of that El Nino, December 98. Uh, the, the green ones are what enough still to be called rainforest. They're not likely to catch fire. But the brown and uh, tan areas, the tan, uh, all the central area, is very flammable forest. And the uh, olive green color there is flammable forest. You can also see that there's lots of fires that are in these highly flammable areas. So I submit to you if that El Nino had lasted longer than one year, if it had lasted two years, we could have been in very, very serious trouble. And the calculations have been done about how serious. This just shows you the El Nino history. This is the temperature in the Central Pacific, which is basically the way you measure them. Uh, in an El Nino, the Central Pacific warms up uh, more than a half a degree before you call it El Nino, and falls more than half a degree before you call it La Nina. Well, so the big ones are, here's one at two degrees, and here's about two and a quarter and two and a half degrees, uh, but they all are over in one year. Now, there are plenty of El Ninos that last two years, like this one in the 80s here. So all you've really got to imagine is that, as over on the right, we get a double duration big El Nino uh, for it to push us into an interesting catastrophe. This shows you the hypothetical big burn. Down at the bottom is just the way things are rising in the Keeling curve now. So it's going up about two parts per million every year, 
Now, if you should burn off sizable parts of the Amazon and Borneo rainforests, you would dump uh, about 40 parts per million into the atmosphere over a few years, uh, both from the fire and then the decay of the, uh, the deadwood. Um, and that would increase our excess CO2 by about 40% in a very short order. It's a good way of running a lot of your efforts. <clears throat> On top of that, you're missing all the leaves of the trees that burn down. And so now the CO2 from the same inputs uh, goes up 50% faster because there aren't the methods of taking it out of the air in the quantities that existed before. So you certainly have a situation where climate would take a jump of large proportions. You might ask, when might this happen? And of course, nobody knows, because nobody understands the El Nino schedule. We certainly don't understand the schedule for big ones. Uh, we don't understand what makes the double duration. Uh, we don't understand any of those things. We just know that there was about 10 years between the first two, 15 between the second, and that we've gone 10 years uh, without one. So I would count 1999 as a near miss. The other important thing to realize is that a big burn causes a mass extinction event, just like uh, meteors and such from space. Uh, the estimates are that about half of all Amazonic species will go extinct. And here's three of my favorite Amazon species. Uh, here's two of my favorite Borneo species, the orangutan and the siamang. You've got to figure uh, that we had a near miss of causing the first anthropogenic mass extension event. So we need a reverse gear for both the tortoise and the hare. We don't just need palliation of, yeah, we, this sort of uh, going about it um, the way we currently are. So now let me finish and say something about our, the need and the ability to turn on a dime. There are some good uh, reasons for optimism. I think we already have longer term power solutions. We don't have to wave our hands about what might be invented in the future, but probably you know, will be if to improve the situation. Uh, we could, in fact, do a lot of the near term 2020 if we act quickly. And here are three things in combination which I can imagine uh, allowing us to do that uh, the plug in hybrids and the other ways of using the electrical grid for commuting. Um, would mean a major overhaul of the uh, uh, passenger vehicle fleet, sort of like I saw in Hungary. Uh, <clears throat> if we start building a lot of gigawatt-sized power plants that are clean, nuclear and the deep geothermal would be my favorites. Um, and finally, we're going to have to do something to help all those countries have their own coal and oil and who will want to modernize. Uh, using them, and I think we'll need to do something like uh, not provide them with nuclear plants, although 31 countries already have them, uh, but by um, drilling deep geothermal wells for them uh, and leaving them for them to run, because it's basically an old-fashioned steam plant. It's not a matter of having to have expatriates come in and run it for you. Um, so something like this uh, has the possibility for uh, getting at the problem worldwide, which we must do. It's not just a question of big countries doing something. We've got to tackle it widely. Now, finally, uh, we can indeed turn on a dime, and many countries have done it before. Uh, for the US audiences, I use this example. That President Roosevelt in 1940 used the metaphor of a four-alarm fire up the street, referring to Europe, uh, that needed to be extinguished immediately, whatever the cost. And indeed, from a standing start in late 1941, uh, the automoma automobile makers converted in a matter of months, not years, more than 1,000 automobile plants to do something entirely different, like uh, build uh, airplanes, uh, tanks, Ford turned out a bomber every 63 minutes. I mean, basically, we have turned on a dime in the past. And we should realize that 
viewing this much as we would view the eve of a, of a great war is the kind of way that we're going to have to start looking at it. Uh, it's summarized very nicely by Evan Burke, statesman of a few centuries ago, who said, the public interest requires doing today those things that men of intelligence, goodwill would wish five or ten years hence had been done. And he's got the right time frame, too. Thank you.